So I'm very pleased to um, have been invited to speak at this uh, at this meeting. I wanted to, first of all, I have to say a disclaimer. I'm, of course, uh, speaking only on my personal capacity, so don't, don't attribute this to the Austrian Foreign Ministry, please. Um, I wanted to address three points in my presentation. First is, is basically why the TPNW, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, is a significant step forward, why, why, it, is, why it matters, and why it's a historical and uh, hopefully transformational development. Then I will talk a little bit about some of the counter-narrative, the counter-arguments that are used uh, to oppose the treaty. And finally, a few points on, on uh, how the TPNW and its arguments can be, can be supported specifically by, by civil society. Um, please stop me when I'm going over time. I hope I won't, uh, but uh, I'll, I, there's maybe too much to say. Um, so firstly, why the TPNW is a significant development. Uh, it is the first comprehensive prohibition of the only weapons of mass destruction that wasn't subject to a comprehensive prohibition. So it is a significant step. It is a big deal. It is the culmination of 75 years uh, of effort. Uh, as was said, many steps forward, more steps back and uh, backwards, unfortunately. So achieving this normative uh, standard is a very, very important uh, um, aspect. It's not the solution to the issue, but it is a very significant aspect. Around the year 2010, a small group of states, diplomats, academic experts, civil society uh, experts began to devise how to reframe the discourse on nuclear weapons to focus on the humanitarian dimension, the humanitarian impact of these weapons, of explosions, and of the risks um, that are associated with these weapons. And this humanitarian focus had some very important consequences. It, because when you really look at the impact of these weapons, um, the humanitarian and other consequences, you see that they are much graver and they're more complex and they're more widespread than was previously assumed. And similarly, looking at the many risks associated with this weapon, that something happens either intentionally or unintentionally through any form of accident, you also see that these risks are much graver and more complex than previously understood. We don't know exactly the probability about these risks, but we know that the risks are very high because the consequences are so grave. And we know that in the past, on several occasions, uh, humanity came very close to the brink and was just simply lucky that nothing happened. So this combined look at the humanitarian consequences and risks of nuclear weapons, it changes the discussion about abstract concepts of nuclear deterrence and it changes the discussion into a very concrete and tangible discussion about the concrete threat to all humanity. And most of all, it changes the discussion into a direction that nuclear weapon states don't want to go to because the human security, it's a human security focus. It counters the nuclear weapon states uh, narrative on security, on responsibility, and on the legitimacy of the nuclear status quo. From such, a hum from such a human security perspective ensues the question of responsibility. How can the risk, the threat and risk of inflicting global consequences, possibly threatening all humankind, be considered as a responsible policy? And conversely, if nuclear armed states, as they are, are stuck in a, this vicious circle of justifying their possession of nuclear weapons with the possession of nuclear weapons by others, if they're stuck in that circle, what is then the responsibility of non-nuclear weapon states of the rest of the world? So the human security arguments about consequences and risks, that appeals to a sense of responsibility of all states and the call for action to strengthen the normative framework um, for nuclear disarmament. So the, these humanitarian arguments reinforce the reasoning that it's the responsibility and the legitimate security interest of non-nuclear weapon states to take matters into their own hands, given the unwillingness of nuclear weapon states to take more credible steps. So rather than continue, as we have done for many, many decades, to merely demand from nuclear armed states that they fulfill their 
disarmament promises, um, setting a norm in international law that emerged as the one concrete action that non-nuclear weapon states were able to effect themselves. And they had the responsibility to do it. And it is, of course, one way how each and every state can contribute to nuclear disarmament and to the implementation of the NPT. So the TPNW represents a few very important developments. Um, it is in a way a, a sort of democratic shift in the nuclear weapons debate. This humanitarian reframing makes the nuclear weapons issue much more accessible because all states have this legitimate stake in it. A delegate from an African country may have not much to say on nuclear deterrence, but has a lot to say on the humanitarian consequences. Um, because that is an issue that affects every country. Um, given that nuclear weapons are an existential threat to all humanity, they should not be dealt with in the 21st century as a national security prerogative only of a few states. But this democratic shift was not only related to the substantive issue, but also to the way how we approach this issue, because um, we went through the UN General Assembly, which of course is the main democratic body of the UN um, to seek a mandate for these negotiations. Because in the General Assembly, you can actually vote. Whereas in the usual uh, multilateral fora where disarmament issues are discussed, a strict co consensus rule applies. And a strict consensus rule sounds good, but in reality, it's a veto um, mechanism. And that is the way how nuclear weapon states have essentially been able to manage and control multilateral processes. So breaking out of the consensus straitjacket really was essential. And it was, of course, this loss of control over multilateral processes that nuclear weapon states really wanted to, to prevent. And then another democratic um, aspect is, is, of course, is the prohibition in the TPNW itself, because it's without exceptions. There are no special rules for anybody. Nuclear weapons are simply prohibited because of the humanitarian consequences and risks. Secondly, the TPNW is a clarification put into international law where the majority of states stand on the urgency of nuclear disarmament and on the rationale for nuclear disarmament. What I mean by that is that how can actually nuclear disarmament ever be an urgent priority when nuclear armed states deem these weapons necessary for their own defense at the same time? As long as this is the case, no transformational steps uh, to move forward uh, will ever be taken. So nuclear disarmament is always and has always been mired by this unsolvable contradiction managed conceptually only by presenting nuclear disarmament as this aspirational goal in the far distant future in a as yet wholly undefined security environment where these weapons are not needed. But this is why nuclear disarmament steps that have been agreed to in the past have always been heavily qualified and are in essence not implemented because nuclear weapon states cannot solve the contradiction that on the one hand, they want to keep these weapons, and on the other hand, they want to pursue nuclear disarmament. So the reasons why the TPNW emerged as a viable route for the majority of states was firstly, because it's the only transformational uh, measure that they can take without the necessary engagement of, of nuclear armed states and without the sanctus of those states. But secondly, it emerged precisely because of this contradiction, because nuclear weapon states are unable themselves to demonstrate the sense of urgency or credible leadership, um, let alone formulate any vision how they think a world without nuclear weapons could be achieved. So the adoption of the TPNW is a legally binding clarification on the part of the majority of states that nuclear disarmament is an urgent priority and that the implementation thus far of the NPT disarmament obligations and commitments has, far, has been far from satisfactory and or credible. And of course, not surprisingly, nuclear weapon states oppose this clarification because it exposes their double standard on the issue. Thirdly, maybe most importantly, the TPNW is the most substantive challenge to the doctrine of nuclear deterrence. 
One can agree or disagree with the legal dimension of the TPNW. Um, states either join or they don't. But the findings on the humanitarian consequences and risks of nuclear weapons, they are based on empirically demonstrable facts. The evidence of humanitarian consequences and risks that must be weighed against the positive, the positive security benefit of nuclear weapons. And doing this with a humanitarian mindset raises some very pertinent questions. What, for example, is the probability, the balance of probability between the belief that nuclear weapons deter and prevent large scale wars and the knowledge that nuclear deterrence can fail and the measurable humanitarian consequences that would be the result? If consequences of nuclear weapons are not only grave, but graver than previously realized, and they also not fully understood, does this impact on the nuclear deterrence cost benefit analysis? Does this impact on the credibility of nuclear deterrence? Um, what in terms of humanitarian consequences is acceptable and for whom? Are there objective criteria for this and can they be assessed? How exactly do nuclear armed states integrate humanitarian consequences uh, into their nuclear deterrence calculations? How do nuclear planners weigh a military target against collateral damage? And what are the parameters for this? For example, in the case of a major city. Also given the demonstrable transboundary consequences of nuclear weapons, how are the principles of international, uh, of the law of armed conflict, the principles of uh, distinction and proportionality, how exactly are they applied vis-a-vis populations in third countries that are not party to a conflict? What about the responsibility to deal with the humanitarian emergency in case of an accident uh, or to clean up uh, after an accident? What about compensation? All these issues, these are extremely pertinent and legitimate questions that follow when you approach nuclear weapons, not from a uh, uh, abstract security policy construct, but you actually look at the humanitarian consequences. And once these issues are raised and discussed in concrete terms, um, the rationalization of nuclear deterrence and the balance of arguments may shift significantly. For the non-nuclear weapon states, the grave humanitarian consequences that would result from nuclear explosions, these are, they are the risks to which they are exposed to against their will and outside their control. And these risks are inherent in possessing and maintaining nuclear weapons. So the collective nuclear weapons policies of all nuclear armed states, they create an aggregated and interconnected set of risks. And in many ways, this is the sort of key significance of the TPNW that it changes the discourse of nuclear weapons it challenges the nuclear status quo, and it exposes through the creation of international law the double standards that exist on the issue of nuclear weapons. And it clarifies that the majority of states see this status quo as illegitimate and unlawful. And of course, the TPNW development has only begun. The treaty will enter into force only in January, and it's not yet clear if its transformational potential can be fulfilled but it offers the possibility to do so if the norm and the arguments on which the TPNW uh, is based, if they continue to grow. A few points on the sort of counter arguments that have been made. Obviously, because the TPNW is such a challenge, opponents of the TPNW have spared no efforts to fight the treaty and to try to undermine it. And maybe this opposition, this very strong opposition, is probably the best indication of the transformational uh, potential of the TPNW and the argument on which it is based. And who wins this argumentative contest uh, is going to be very decisive and it's unclear at the moment. But the sheer power and dominance of nuclear weapon states, of the nuclear weapons establishment, including the expert security policy expert think tank community, all of whom are in a way enablers of the continuation of the nuclear status quo fight against it. So it's really 
very important uh, um, that civil society creates enough pressure um, in the other direction. So this role is very important. One of the key tactics that was employed against the treaty was actually deflection. Because nuclear weapon states have shown very limited engagement on the actual issue of humanitarian consequences and risks of nuclear weapons. They've not engaged on this, they've not provided answers or commented in any detail on the key conclusions and the kind of questions I raised in the uh, just a moment before. And the reason for that is probably because there are no good counter arguments. Because it would reveal a willingness on the part of nuclear weapon states that they accept humanitarian consequences, not only for their own population and the population of an adversary, but also on third countries, indeed on all humanity, as a necessary collateral to maintaining a nuclear deterrence-based notion of security and stability. And whenever we raised the issue of humanitarian consequences, the answer we got was, well, a ban treaty is not the answer but there was never actual really engagement uh, on the issue. Um, another obvious accusation or point is that the TPNW is ineffective. Because nuclear weapon states don't take part in it, it will be effective. But that argument, it misses the point of the TPNW because the point is that a legally binding uh, non-discriminatory non-discriminatory prohibition of nuclear weapons is the necessary legal basis for the elimination of nuclear weapons and the practical measure towards this objective. So true, challenging the legality and the legitimacy of nuclear weapons and the practice of nuclear deterrence in itself does not eliminate nuclear weapons, but it certainly has the potential of impacting nuclear weapons policies and uh, the thinking behind nuclear deterrence. So from the point of view of the humanitarian initiative and supporters of the TPNW, this is exactly why the TPNW is valid. This lever is what makes the TPNW important. The TPNW has been accused of only being a humanitarian focused treaty that does not take the security environment into account. That's also um, a very selective perception of security. Opponents of the TPNW, of course, are entitled to have uh, uh, their views on security, but they neither own the exclusive right to interpret the NPT, nor are they the sole arbiter of whose security pers perspectives are more valid uh, than others. Because the threat perceptions of non-nuclear weapon states, because of the existence of nuclear weapons by others and the risks to which they are uh, exposed to, they are based they are not just humanitarian, they are based on equally valid and pertinent security considerations. And the argument that one must wait for a future security environment in which nuclear deterrence is no longer needed as a precondition for nuclear disarmament, that's a disingenuous argument. Because there will always be real or perceived security imbalances between states. And if one follows this line of argument, it will provide an excuse in perpetuity to never alter the nuclear status quo. Because states are simply more likely to eliminate nuclear weapons if they are morally unacceptable and legally prohibited. Then in a situation as we have now, where the, where the virtues of these weapons uh, continue to be highlighted at every turn. For the states that support the TPNW, this logic is compelling and is based firmly on security considerations. And in many ways, the most uh, disingenuous and offensive counter argument is that the TPNW undermines the NPT, uh, which uh, is, is continues to be used. Uh, firstly, the states that have promoted this initiative are among the strongest supporters of the NPT to accuse, for example, Ireland that essentially invented the NPT or South Africa that actually disarmed and joined the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state of undermining the NPT that can only be considered as grossly confrontational. And of course, it's exacerbated by the fact that these accusations come primarily from states whose own 
lackluster NPT implementation record or nuclear disarmament are the main reason why this whole initiative was started in the first place. In fact, utmost care was taken in the negotiations of the TPNW to ensure that this treaty explicitly and structurally fits into the framework of the NPT. It's a necessary measure for the implementation of Article 6 of the NPT, um, so it's a completely disingenuous accusation. There are other arguments that are made, not enough time to address them, but closer analysis of all those arguments shows that uh, they do not stand up to scrutiny or cannot be substantiated. Rather, they are an expression of politically motivated counter narrative from those states who object to the humanitarian viewpoint and to the TPNW. And this is, of course, because this approach challenges the nuclear status quo, which they consider to be very beneficial for them, and because they are opposed and maybe afraid of the great transformational potential of the TPNW and its underlying arguments. And I'll close with a few points on, uh, on uh, how the TPNW can be supported, uh, um, especially by civil society. And again, I, want, I just cannot overemphasize the importance of, uh, uh, of the role civil society needs to play. This is particularly the case in, in, of, of civil society organizations in nuclear weapon states. And of course, uh, the Scottish CND, I'm sure will continue to play a very active role on this. Uh, there are several points. Firstly, I think it's extremely important to make sure that the debate on nuclear weapons gets broader and more inclusive again than it is now. There's no conceptual reason why the immediate danger posed by nuclear weapons should not attract as much attention um, and interest as the climate change issue. In fact, there is a very strong connection, powerful connection between the two issues anyway. And the arguments, the humanitarian arguments and the risk arguments are a powerful tool to make the issue understandable and accessible to a much broader set of audiences. And the TPNW now provides a framework, a concrete framework to make these points and to carry the rationale for a prohibition much deeper into the political discourse. Uh, um, so civil society will, will be absolutely essential to do that. Second, the second key point is to counter and deconstruct the disingenuous counter narrative against the TPNW, because there is a, there is a, almost an overwhelming wave of powerful actors making these counter-narrative courses, so there needs to be a counterbalance uh, to it. Um, and to actually counter these deflection tactics, um, to actually force a discussion on the humanitarian consequences and, and, uh, and risks. And here I would see, for example, Scotland uh, um, has a wide range of particularly pertinent uh, points to make, uh, given that nuclear weapons are, are, are stored uh, there. Um, so the issue of humanitarian consequences of nuclear explosions, whether they occur in a conflict or by accident, is not an abstract issue. It's a very concrete issue. And these pertinent questions, there is a lot of legitimacy <laughs> to raise uh, these questions, some of which I've mentioned in my presentation because I think a much broader discourse about these important issues offers the best chance to challenge the thinking that considers nuclear deterrence as indispensable and to finally take steps away from high risk, uh, from this high risk and ultimately unsustainable perspective of security. Last year, I took part as an expert witness in the House of Lords Select Committee on Nuclear Weapons. And while the report they produced endorses the government's opposition against the TPNW, it nevertheless offers a few important opportunities. It says, for example, that dissatisfaction with the nuclear status quo should be taken seriously. It recommends that the government should adopt a less aggressive tone against the TPNW and seek opportunities to work with its supporters. And importantly, it recommends more openness on the part of the UK I need one, one more minute, I'm almost finished. Uh, more openness from the UK on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons and a willingness to, to work with uh, TPNW supporters. So I hope there will be engagement and openness. 
that should mean also that pressure campaigns discouraging countries not to join the treaty that nuclear weapon states are doing at the moment that they should seize. Um, role of parliamentarians, role of civil society will be very important. I hope that uh, um, uh, I see many of you in the first meeting of states parties, Austria has offered to host this meeting, which will have to take one year after the entry into force of the TPNW. And to conclude my last point, there are two scenarios possible. One is that the TPNW is a determined challenge to the nuclear status quo, but it's unsuccessful. The trend towards nuclearism and new arms race continues. And the more transformative scenario would be one in which the TPNW leads to great engagement uh, on the consequences and risks and international humanitarian law. And both scenarios will depend very much on what happens to the momentum created by the TPNW after its entry into force. Uh, we, are, we are at the crossroads on the nuclear weapons issue. And uh, the TPNW now offers opportunity for transformational change, which can either be missed or it can be used. So I stop here. I'm sorry for being uh, a bit too long. Um, and I look forward to the discussion and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our heartfelt thanks for that um, on behalf of Scottish CND. Now we have an exciting period to follow of discussion with the floor, but we have, I'm going to, there's two uh, particular people who I'm going to ask. Um, we are very, uh, lucky to have with us David Hutchison Edgar and I'm going to ask Janet Fenton to introduce him in a minute but before that I'm going to turn to our own MSP Bill Kidd um, and just ask him to say um, uh, just a few, I believe he has a message for us and I wish to invite him to to give us that message. Uh, hello hi hi thanks very much um, it was a great privilege and pleasure to follow Alexander Comment. Alexander is, is a, a real um, a guiding light internationally and uh, and it will be great to welcome him back to Scotland once Thank things you. down again. Uh, he has been here before of course and been to the Scottish Parliament and met the First Minister and uh, he was incredibly impressive um, so it's great to see him in this conference. Um, so I just uh, like to point uh, to the TPNW the fact that um, in 2017 at the conference um, at the UN I presented a letter of support for the success of the conference in passing the treaty from the yeah. First Minister uh, to the chair of the TPNW conference and that was Ambassador Elaine Gomez-White from Costa Rica and included in the letter that I passed over uh, was a quote from Sir Walter Scott um, saying that we hoped that the, the nations of the world had the will to achieve and the soul to believe, and they did very, very much indeed, and it was fantastic uh, to be there at that point. Um, so the First Minister um, has sent a message for today, and uh, she says, um, she asked me to read it because um, she thought her voice would be too deep on this uh, electronic sort of stuff, you know. Um, no, she didn't. Uh, so <laughs> she said, my commitment uh, to a world without nuclear weapons has been unshakable since I first joined CND as a teenager in the 1980s. The need for nations and governments to work together to secure a safer, more peaceful world is as great now as it was then and the ratification on October the 24th of the Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW, by 50 states at the UN is an important step forward towards that goal, which I welcome. The Scottish Government, along with most Scottish MSPs and MPs and large sections of Scottish civil society stand firmly against weapons of mass destruction and I commend Scottish CND and their international colleagues for taking forward the work needed to secure a safer future for us all. So that's the message from uh, Scotland's First Minister for today. 
and um, I hope that, um, I'm, I'm sure that was welcome, uh, but I hope it, it would help. Um, I know that she would have liked to have been with us, but as we all know what's happening just now, there's there's a lot of things taking place which meant she couldn't. So those words, I hope, will um, stand as a sign that the Scottish Government is as committed as ever to the removal of Trident and uh, the achievement of a world without nuclear weapons. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. And we will we will write and thank the First Minister, but you can perhaps also convey our thanks. And thanks to you, Bill, for being here and all your own hard work, which is also tireless. Thank you. And now I'm, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to ask Janet to introduce our other guest, David Hutchinson Edgar. Janet, would you like to introduce David for us, please? I certainly would. It's uh, It was a, a wonderful experience to hear Alexander uh, inspiring us and informing us. And uh, the, the work that was done um, for the treaty through Austria is enormous and, and is, gives great hope to Scotland. And I'd like to also thank Bill for uh, delivering such a great message from the First Minister. And uh, Ireland is another country that has been very instrumental and, and enormously effective in working for the treaty and working for nuclear disarmament for a long time. They were initiators of the, of the NPT and uh, have, you know, it's in their DNA getting rid of, getting rid of the nuclear threat. They really understand that. And for that reason, our, our next speaker, David Hutchison Edgar, who's the coordinator of Irish CND, it needs to be pointed out that Irish CND is, uh, is not a pressure group. CND in the UK is a pressure group. Uh, and even here in Scotland, we have limited capacity. Um, and uh, but I, Irish CND is, works as an advisory really to its its government and um, David has been an enormous source of information research and uh, has worked on the legislation that's gone through the Irish government. So he, he's uh, he's a real hands-on activist, academic researcher and uh, all around interesting person to hear from. So uh, David, over to you. Thank you, Janet, and thank you to Scottish CND for the <clears throat> invitation to be with you this morning. I would love to be with you in person, but it's great to be able to join you uh, over Zoom in any case. And uh, tremendous thanks also to Alexander for his uh, presentation this morning, uh, but also for all the work that he and uh, the Austrian government and diplomats have put into uh, the momentum that has built to this point and hopefully will continue with the, uh, the TPNW. And as Janet said, the, uh, the Irish foreign policy has always been oriented towards disarmament rather than militarism. Um, I think in some ways that may emerge out of the birth of Ireland as an independent country um, roughly a hundred years ago, <clears throat> which came not just from, um, uh, not just from armed conflict with Britain, but also a vicious civil war for two years, which doesn't get as much mention. So that um, you know, the urge towards peace was very much part of the, our building our own statehood, and I think has continued into our foreign policy. And as Alexander mentioned, um, Ireland has very much emphasised the importance of the TPNW as something which complements and completes the uh, non-proliferation treaty. And I want to quote very briefly the Irish Foreign Minister speaking last year in 2019 before the TPNW had reached its 50, um, uh, 50 ratifications. Uh, speaking at the conference in Geneva, he said, um, we must also be creative and original in our approach to achieving our shared goal of a world without nuclear weapons and not be limited by traditional one-dimensional thinking. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons offers us a path to nuclear disarmament by finally putting in place a workable legal framework for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. The treaty is fully complementary with the NPT, 
The TPNW strengthens and reinforces the NPT and reaffirms its corner, it as the cornerstone of the disarmament and non-proliferation regime. It is a facilitator, not an impediment to progress. As recognised in the NPT, TPNW and throughout the discussions on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, the only true guarantee against the horrors of nuclear weapons is the total elimination of nuclear weapons. And um, I think that sums up a lot of points very um, clearly and briefly, that we have an opportunity within the international community to move towards nuclear disarmament in a way that has never been there before, which, which builds on what we have up to this point. Uh, and that one of the important arguments put by those who are not currently supporting the TPNW, that it is somehow in conflict with the existing government uh, frameworks. And um, <clears throat> it provides what Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, seeks. And Irish diplomats have often commented to me that um, you know, the NPT, while it is the existing framework for nuclear issues, no weapon has ever been disarmed under the NPT and no weapon ever will be disarmed under the NPT because the NPT doesn't contain within itself a framework for disarmament and always envisages some further uh, framework. And that is what the TPNW provides. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> TPNW has already been effectively put into, uh, put into Irish domestic law with the passing of an act of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons Act in uh, the uh, Irish Parliament uh, last December. And um, <clears throat> this will come into effect with the entry into force of the, the treaty. Uh, one of the significant things that I think it will achieve is that it will ban investment of any Irish state funds in any companies involved in the nuclear weapons industry. And we expect that the Irish government will issue a list of companies banned for the investment of state funds because of their involvement in nuclear weapons. Um, at some point shortly after entry into force. Um, we already have a ban on investments in cluster munitions and landmines, uh, and many of the same companies will be involved. So it may not actually change our list of banned companies, but nuclear weapons will now be, um, will now be one of the criteria for prohibitions of investments in Ireland. And that is an important step because it shows that uh, non-nuclear weapon states are not powerless on the sidelines. We can still take action and take action in a meaningful way which affects the nuclear weapons industry and not simply nuclear weapon doctrines. And I think that is important. And <clears throat> that in itself, I think, creates momentum where uh, not just states, but also financial institutions will feel pressure in terms of what they are doing with their money and their investments. And <clears throat> already uh, a number of major international uh, pension funds and uh, other institutions have looked at and withdrawn from nuclear weapons companies or are considering withdrawal of their funds from nuclear weapons companies. So um, that momentum is there and hopefully it will continue. Um, <clears throat> an important point to note, I think, in terms of the statement that I read out from the Irish uh, foreign minister is that it represents significantly the cross-party consensus, the universality of support for nuclear disarmament in Ireland. Uh, the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons Act was passed with unanimous support in the Irish Parliament from all parties. And um, I think that is something that it is important to build and to build um, perhaps in Scotland also that Nuclear weapons is not a party political issue. It is a human and humanitarian issue. And uh, that is one of the key motivations for the present process. And I think once we can cross those party boundaries, then it is only a matter of process until we can achieve greater uh, integration, even in a limited circumstances like in Scotland, where you do not control foreign policy uh, in the Scottish Parliament but uh, hopefully 
any steps are possible. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And that was uh, a fantastic place to end um, because it maybe helps people come into the discussion. And uh, so now um, there's some uh, stuff in chat, uh, um, people raising issues. Um, there's a lot of burble in chat about multiple topics, but uh, some issues are coming up um, that maybe are starting to form sort of questions uh, to you and to Alexander. So this is a kind of time where we're hoping that, that we will have um, dialogue and that people in the audience will feel able um, to be the participants rather than the audience. Um, so um, it's always difficult to get these things started, but I think what I would like to do is to try and take several contributions rather than um, just take one contribution and then come back to the, the sort of main speakers. Um, so um, I'm going to also get help by from my um, other officers here to um, to get this right. So uh, to start off, um, you can also please use the hands up signal, which if you remember is um, at the bottom of your, it's on the bottom of your sort of participants list. Um, so, um, Lynn, I've been monitoring the chat and there's a few questions that have already come in. So, right. um, would it be helpful if I, yes. I read them out? Or, yeah. Yes. And yes. the first one, um, there was a few requests for a hard copy of the presentation, but this has been recorded and it will be circulated. So just to cover that one. Uh, but Rosalind Cook had asked, what is the potential um, in seeing a shift in terms of racial injustice and nuclear weapons, as well as the imposition of colonial powers on nuclear testing, and the fact that there is a continuing refusal to acknowledge the ongoing um, consequences of the nuclear testing by colonial powers. Um, so that was one question that was uh, probably most appropriate for Alexander. Um, there was another question from Kate and David who wanted to ask, how do we address the issue of a smooth transition from um, an NPT to the TPNW consciousness. It's clear to us that TPNW is the next stage uh, and the nine nuclear states need some help with this. And then there was another question, or, so we'll just take this third one right now. Um, how do we convince states who already have nuclear weapons that they are no longer a deterrent? So these are probably three questions for Alexander at the moment. Right, okay. So those are all quite big questions, but, <clears throat> and that last one was from whom, Gail? Sorry, that was from Kirstine Larkin. Right, okay, just so that those people know that they're being acknowledged. Um, now, does anyone else wish to s say something on those themes before we come back to the, the speaker? Um, Mike Martin uh, also wants to ask a question. Anne is saying, is Mike in the chat or is Mike showing? Uh... Oh yeah, um, uh, it's a very straightforward question. Uh, in the absence of us being able to persuade the UK government um, to sign up to the TPNW, um, what mileage do the uh, contributors give to the idea of uh, getting our towns to become a, a nuclear ban community. I noticed East Ayrshire, Renfrewshire, Dumbart West Dumbartonshire, Edinburgh and Fife have signed up notionally to this uh, treaty. Thank you, Martin. Yep. And I think we have one other in the chat. Um, do we? Um, Mark Langdon, Education System in Ireland. Promote peace education, okay, so that's a specific question. Maybe we can come back to that one. Um, do, Alexandra, do you want to try to respond to what you've got already? Or would you like to hear some more? Let me see what you, you feel about this. No, thank you. Uh, 
I'd be happy to try. It's of course very big questions. I'll try yes, to they are rather large questions. So um, that. Maybe I take the last one first on the uh, what what mileage uh, short of the ratification by states uh, other actions. I think it's very important. I think we see the inter the, the the way international relations work uh, that changes. Uh, it's no longer only. Uh, what happens at the state level? It happens. It, it, we're moving into a sort of multi-stakeholder uh, world. Anyway, if you look at the climate change issue, the U.S. has left the Paris uh, um, the treaty, but actions by individual um, states, by by communities, by corporations, that's all very important and contributes to it. So I would see this as very important. Um, on the smooth transition from an NPT to a TPNW mindset, I would just re reiterate what I said and what David has said, that um, there is no distinction between um, the TPNW and the NPT. The TPNW is a sort of enabling step of the NPT. So we don't want to transition from the NPT we, we have the TPNW to help the implementation of the NPT and to help to achieve the objective that, that, that's actually contained in the NPT. So uh, um, I, I don't think it's correct to speak from a transition from one mindset to the other. It's more to uh, help um, focus on the underlying arguments of the TPNW to actually get to the implementation of the NPT and the achievement of a world without nuclear weapons. A big question is also the sort of racial equality and colonial dimension. I just want to address one point uh, uh, of it, one aspect of it. Um, most of the nuclear weapon testing has taken place uh, in countries um, where indigenous populations have been yeah. mostly affected. Uh, and what was a really important contribution of the TPNW process and the humanitarian initiative was to give voice to those people. We had uh, not just testimonials from the victims of the Japanese bombings, but we had uh, um, many voices from Australia to uh, Kazakhstan um, and uh, the Pacific Islands. So, um, giving voice to people who were affected by that nuclear violence is extremely important. So it is very clearly linked to the, to the uh, racial and colonial issue. And, and uh, the last question was, uh, um, uh, yeah, how, how to convince states that have these weapons? Um, it's, it's the set of questions that the TPNW and the humanitarian approach asks it challenges the notion that nuclear deterrence actually works, at least to the extent as people who have those weapons um, uh, say they do. It's a dogma. It is posited. And uh, the problem is we cannot wait until we prove that it's false because with nuclear weapons, you cannot afford to do that. Yeah. So you have to have a discussion and you have to weigh what you know against what you assume. And a lot about nuclear deterrence is assumed. And a lot about what nuclear weapons actually do can be, is based on empirical fact. And this discussion, this weighing of the different concepts, that has the biggest potential in my view, I'm totally convinced of it, to actually help those countries that have those weapons. Once they make the conceptual switch that they're actually ready to challenge the dogma of nuclear de deterrence. Once they are ready to engage in this discussion, that is the that is the way to 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 shift the discussion in a direction that has the potential to actually move away from nuclear weapons. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David, I think there was a question there specifically for you about uh, peace education in Ireland. Do you want to uh, deal with that one? Um, yeah, peace education as such isn't a subject in Ireland. Um, 
it would be touched on in certain aspects of the curriculum in terms of um, Ireland's involvement in peacekeeping and um, political study, uh, um, particularly at the second level. There's a lot of flexibility within that aspect of the curriculum. So it's uh, unfortunately not a major aspect of the um, of the Irish education system. Um, I think it's probably more significant that there isn't a culture of going to war in Ireland. And unfortunately, Ireland's recent history through the 70s and 80s with a lot of violence in Northern Ireland in the background has probably led a lot of people to have um, a much more of a cultural orientation towards peace um, and towards anything that seems to give momentum towards peace rather than conflict. Um, and that cultural orientation, I think, itself in itself is important. Yes, thank you. That is helpful. And actually, I sometimes fear there is quite a culture of militarism in Scotland, um, although we have got a population who are much more against nuclear weapons. Um, so, Gail, is there any anything else that's come up in chat? Um, Mike Martin would like to ask a question. It's not in the chat, but if you would like to unmute yourself, Mike, we can hear your question. Sorry, I, I forgot to put my hand down. I beg your pardon. Right, that's great. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um, okay, so Linda, do you want to come in? I can see Linda Pearson is uh, putting something in chat. Do you want to speak, Linda? Hi, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, no, I was just really interested to hear what David was saying about the Irish legislation in relation to investments. And I was wondering if it will apply to organisations like banks, um, private investors, or is it just going to be that state organisations um, won't be able to invest in those companies? And what what is actually meant by state organisations? Thank you. Right, so let me just check if there's anyone else wants to say anything on that particular theme before coming back to David. I saw uh, Kenneth Wardrop reminded us that Stirling Council were also about to um, sign up to uh, the ICANN Cities appeal in support of the TPNW. That's not quite the same as uh, disinvesting, but um, is there anyone, um, I know that among the trade unionists among us, is there anybody who wants, I mean, we're possibly all trade unionists, but those who are, we have in Scotland been trying to get um, the Scottish government to take the issue of not just disinvestment in that sense of not putting money into certain organisations, but also in the sense of conversion from defence industries to other industries. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to say anything around that, but um, before coming back to David. Okay, fine, never mind. We'll just come back to David. I'm just trying to make sure, <laughs> I'm trying to make sure you've all got chances to come in here. David, would you like to just uh, reply to the question? Thank you. As I understand it at present, based on the, the parallel with cluster munitions and landmines, it would apply to state uh, funds. So say the state pension fund and those kind of funds, rather than to private companies or private or, or banking organizations or those kind of uh, institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, Thank you. That was very useful. Thank Great. Thanks, Linda. And thanks for the question. Uh, the I think there's another, is there something else in chat now? Mary Alice is talking about the jobs issue, yes. Um, although I think, Paul Shaw, do you want to come in? I don't know that there... I think there is quite a lot of work showing that, I mean, obviously it's not a straightforward issue, but the jobs in the defence industry, um, it's always, we've always tried to argue that if you spent the same amount of money in other industries, you generate even more jobs. Um, Linda, you're obviously also an expert on this. 
Um, I don't know whether anyone else wants to comment on this issue. Okay. Let's um, let some a new here run then. Um, Bill, please come in. Hi, uh, Pylan, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, we can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just to say, um, I think it is important that uh, sort of teaching your granny to suck eggs and all that sort of thing, but it is important, I think, that we remember um, the work that was done, Scottish CND and the STUC over this issue in particular, and what could be done um, down the Clyde uh, when we can get rid of the Trident and the development of jobs in particular for renewables, which Scotland has the potential for one quarter of Europe's uh, development of renewable energy. Um, that's not going ahead in the manner in which it could be. Um, but if we get rid of Trident and we turned resource in that area, um, as has been outlined, as I say, on two occasions now, two documents by STUC and Scottish CND, we could actually bring a large number of jobs. All the rubbish that's talked about, about 11,000 jobs dependent on Trident and all that um, down, uh, down at Fasley and Coolport. Uh, could be way overturned. The fact is, is um, there's 420 odd, and in actual fact, are totally dependent on that. Uh, there's up to 4,000 which are which are um, on a on a naval base uh, uh, situation. But the truth is, we could really make a massive difference in terms of jobs and in terms of a contribution uh, to the um, non polluting forms of energy production if we actually changed that focus down there. Um, I think that's very important and we should remember that Scottish CND has, has had a large impact in taking part in that. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. And um, if I was a bit slicker, I'd probably be able to put in chat the links to these reports that you're talking about, but I'm not quite I'm nimble enough. About you just know anyway, sort of thing. So. Thank you. And um, Mark Langdon was asking about activism highlighting the issue of money wasted on Trident. And yes, indeed, we have done that in a variety of ways through our website and newsletters. Um, and uh, Margaret is also pointing out that the campaign against the arms trade have done that too, which is... Uh, yet yeah, an important organisation for us to work with. So thank you for that. Um, and Gail's replying, I think, there in chat. Um, so yeah. And yes, yeah, I guess we were all very disappointed with the UK government's latest announcements, but um, I think somehow we've learned not to expect anything very good from the current government in the UK, but that's not good enough. Um, so and Isabel and I both have questions if you're looking for... Please, yes, please do. do uh, Isabel, you go first. Just to, to ask Alexander, why have Sweden and Finland not ratified the treaty? May this be coming? Uh, is this because of NATO pressure that is coming, although they're not members? Thank you. And uh, my question was um, about, well, I. I'm, a, I'm an international lawyer and I'm, I find it really fascinating um, the way in which now international law as a regime is trying to bring in uh, the, the kind, of, kind of unrecognized voices. And I just wondered how much impact you thought that the indigenous peoples actually had both during treaty negotiations and kind of awareness raising. Um, I've been looking at this in the context of Chagos most recently, but I, I, it's something that I find fascinating and I, I just wondered what, if you thought it actually changed or uh, made much of a difference. 
Thank you. Alexander, we'll go back to you for these two, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, very good questions. Um, Sweden and Finland, yes, uh, um, definitely NATO pressure. Um, there was even, in the case of Sweden, there was even then a leaked report uh, um, how uh, the US basically told Sweden that um, joining the DPNW would, uh, uh, would negatively affect uh, the defense cooperation that Sweden has with NATO. So, um, Mark, you need to mute yourself. <laughs> You're humming. Yeah. Uh, Sweden has conducted a review. Uh, uh, Finland has just formed a new government where they said they will do the same thing. But uh, uh, don't forget that at the European level, there is a lot of talk going on about, uh, um, about uh, EU defense. Uh, um, so then there was certainly concern in Europe about the impact of the Trump presidency on NATO. I think that also plays all into, into um, making it more difficult for either NATO members or countries that have a close relationship with NATO to take a step uh, uh, towards the TPNW. But in all those countries, the situation is fluid. It's not cast in stone. I think it just, just simply depends on how the discourse will develop and uh, who makes uh, the arguments more forcefully. So. Um, that's again a call on civil society to, to do that. And on the, on the second question, I think uh, it's really the role of indigenous uh, people and witnesses in general um, is hugely important. Uh, we also saw that uh, in previous campaigns on uh, anti-personal landmines and cluster munitions, and the same was the case with uh, nuclear weapons. It makes, the, it, makes it concrete. Uh, nuclear weapons, the, 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 the difficulty about nuclear weapons is that we talk about nuclear weapons in the abstract. Uh, that's how nuclear weapon states like to talk about nuclear weapons as a security policy concept where nuclear weapons effectively are there for never to be used. They don't want to talk about what happens if something goes wrong and those weapons are actually used. And the people who can say what happens are those who have lived through this experience. So I think it was hugely important to listen to the Hibakusha, the survivors of uh, the bombings in Japan, and the testing testimonials. Uh, uh, I mean, Bill was at the conference in Vienna. It was very powerful when we heard uh, um, a gravely ill woman from the US uh, who basically suffered from cancer uh, as a result of the nuclear fallout, that is extremely powerful and makes makes this. It takes the it takes the discussion out of the abstract uh, concept into very clearly um, a tangible human experience, a human security discussion, and that's of course absolutely what the countries that want to keep nuclear weapons want to avoid because that makes the discussion more difficult. And that's why they have been deflecting because they actually do not have really good answers because they cannot, there is no credible remedial action for nuclear weapons use. All of these issues, they prefer to keep them in the abstract and survivors make those tangible. And, and, uh, and uh, so short answer was hugely important. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Now we're, we are running out of time. So uh, I know Janet wanted to ask you another question, um, but I think we, unless you can do it incredibly quickly, Janet, um, and Alexander will have to give you a very short answer. Can you do that very quickly? It was just really about the position of Scotland. If, uh, I know that in the SNP response to the independent review by the UK government that they're they're stating a strong support position for the TPNW. Um, given that Scotland 
that is quite outside our devolved competence. If it was to look like it was going to become within our devolved competence, how quickly could Scotland accede or ratify to the treaty? And uh, how much impact would it have on the international community um, if there was a clear indication that an independent Scotland would definitely do that? That's possibly not a very quick question, but um, Alexander, you'll only have you can only give like one sentence answer. I'm sorry. I have to say I don't think I don't think it's up to me to to talk about uh, uh, um, what Scotland does, but of course it would be considered as extremely welcome by those countries that support the TPNW, uh, but. In a way, we already know that Scotland is supportive of the TPW. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. Just wanted to say that I don't have to take the floor afterwards. I really enjoyed that, and I was extremely impressed uh, before I started to speak with a round of introduction to hear so many active members of CMD, which is really wonderful. And I wish uh, uh, we would have. Um, as much uh, engagement by civil society in, in other nuclear weapon states. So thank, thank you, you very so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for being here. And we hope this is the beginning of a long, a long relationship and we will see you at some of our events again. And um, we're so pleased to have you and David. Thank you to you both. Um, thank you. Thank you. So now, yes.